for this session of uh, SAGE's meeting and entitled Managing Bariatric Surgery Emergencies for the Non-Bariatric uh, Patient. And uh, we will begin. I'm going to ask our speakers to try to stick to the 15-minute limit so that we have ample time for discussion. And this will be one of the sessions where people can actually um, email in their questions to us. So we'll not only take questions from the audience, but also questions from folks who are online and, and uh, watching the session uh, by webcast. So we'll begin with our first speaker, who is Dr. Benjamin Schneider from the B.I. Deaconess Hospital in Boston, who will speak to us about dysphagia and food intolerance. Okay. So I'd like to thank you, thank you both for the opportunity to speak here. I'm going to be talking, so I, these are my disclosures. So I'm talking about dysphagia and food intolerance after weight loss surgery in the setting of emergencies. So just to set the stage, for the, over the last several decades, we know that the number of weight loss surgeries has increased dramatically. By 2008, the estimates that were that in the U.S., 220,000 of these operations were being performed. So any of us in the, who covers an emergency room or has a clinic with referring physicians, we're going to hear about complications of weight loss surgery, whether we're a bariatric surgeon or not, and we're going to have to know how to deal with acute emergencies. Um, the readmission rate, we've heard much about that for the gastric bypass in the first year is between 10 and 20 percent. For lap band, it's less, but it's 10 to 15 percent. Of these, germane to this talk, over 50 percent of the readmissions or hospital presentations are related to, to dysphagia, food intolerance, nausea, vomiting, reflux, and the like. Um, you have to remember when you're looking at weight loss surgery patients, their presentation may be very atypical or different from a normal post-operative surgical patient, so you have to keep that into, in mind. There are a few do's and don'ts when you assess a patient who's had weight loss surgery, particularly with dysphagia and odynophagia. Don't lay these patients flat. Many are still morbidly obese. They have a reduced functional re reserve capacity, and they may have respiratory arrests or respiratory compromise. The other thing to keep in mind is if you are working up a patient who has dysphagia or food intolerance, they may have, over the past several day days, developed a column of food in their esophagus. If you lay them fat, flat, they may be at very high risk for aspiration, so keep that in mind. We generally frown on blind placement of nasogastric tubes. You can imagine if you have a dilated pouch and you advance, uh, blindly advance a tube into that, there, you may perforate or disrupt an anastomosis. So if you have to place a nasogastric tube, consider placing it under either fluoroscopy or place it in the mid-esophagus so that you're not advancing it to where you may create a problem. For x-ray studies or contrast studies, we need to remember not to give excess amounts of contrast. Our, the patients have very small pouches. My rule of thumb is that between 150 and 200 milliliters of contrast should suffice in most settings at least to start. Um, otherwise, you're going to create problems, discomfort, or vomiting and aspiration. Um, generally speaking, avoid NSAIDs, aspirin, or steroids early on uh, in your workup until you know what you're dealing with. Because if, if you are contending with an ulcer or something of that sort, you, will, you may exacerbate the problem. It's important that we understand the anatomy. Very seldom are we allowed or afforded an operative note, but if we at least understand what the operation was and the general basics of the, of the anatomy, it'll help with both our differential diagnosis and workup and, and hopefully our treatment. <clears throat> Don't forget to replete vitamins, most importantly. If a patient who's been vomiting, we have, we have very uh, limited thiamine stores and patients will be at risk for thiamine deficiency. So as a rule of thumb, don't replete with glucose initially because you may uh, incite an encephalopathy. Start with uh, LR or normal saline with 100 milligrams of thiamine in, in the preparation as part of your rehydration formula. Um, I generally administer an intravenous proton pump inhibitor, particularly in, the, in, in this setting of dysphagia or, or food intolerance, uh, because we, you could very well be contending with an ulcer. And most importantly, you need to identify emergencies. Um, the, the title of this talk is emer Emergencies in Bariatric Surgery, but very few actually uh, patients presenting with dysphagia or food intolerance are actually in an emergency situation, but you have to understand what those emergencies are, and those are respiratory compromise, um, epigastric or abdominal pain in the setting of these symptoms. So the most common operations you'll see are the lap, lap or adjustable gastric band, the sleeve gastrectomy and the gastric bypass. 
Um, fewer of us will see the vertical banded gastroplasty or the duodenal switch at this point. And probably 2% of surgeons in the U.S. at least are doing uh, duodenal switches, so I'm not going to talk a lot about these, these operations. First, I will touch base on the vertical banded gastroplasty. Very few are being performed, but in the 70s, 80s, and even early 1990s, uh, quite a number of these were still being performed and then before they were largely abandoned because of some of the complications we'll talk about. Generally speaking, the operation was performed by firing an EEA stapler completely through the, the, the posterior and anterior gastric wall. And that allowed for this linear stapled um, non-divided pouch to be for, for performed. Let's see if I can find my slide here. And, uh, and so that was a non-divided pouch. And then because there was the connection between this pouch and the re remnant of the stomach, that, that could dilate. So they put either a silastic or a Marlex ring around that area. The complication rate has been high with the vertical banded gastroplasty. Fistulas from that non-divided pouch are very high from staple line disruption on the order of 30 percent. Um, that may result in reflux symptoms um, progressing to dysphagia or, or, uh, or a food intolerance. Um, generally not, a com not an emergent complication, but it certainly can be if a person is developing bad reflux and is having aspiration events. Obstruction, usually outlet obstruction from the pouch due to either cicatrix or scarring of the, of the mesh, that Marlex or, or uh, silastic ring, or um, if, if a patient develops an erosion of that mesh into, this, into the gastric uh, channel here, they may obstruct as well. And that can be an emergency. They may develop aspiration and have a, a, a very dilated pouch. Um, vomiting is very common as well. The diagnosis is uh, usually performed with a barium or an x-ray study. Endoscopy can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic, particularly in the area of stenosis or narrowing of that band, in, in, the, in which case you may be able to dilate that um, and, and afford, in, in effect, a cure or at least temporize them. Uh, for patients who are long-standing, again, not usually in the acute setting or in, as an emergency, they may be converted to another operation. And usually that would mean converting to a gastric bypass. But again, for non-bariatric surgeons, um, it may or may not be something they would need to perform. The next operation I'll talk about is the sleeve gastrectomy. It's the, one of the most common operations that we're performing these days. Uh, the, the, the most common complication that will lead to dysphagia or food intolerance will be strictures, and that typically will occur between the inchasura and the, and the staple line. The way the, the operation is performed is by placing a bougie, and that allows a guide for the surgeon so as not to make too narrow of a gastric channel. <clears throat> if we use too small of a bougie or our staple line abuts the inchasura too, too closely, we can develop strictures or obstruction, and again, re, re, we, with the uh, attendant um, symptoms and complications. Also, if the staple line were to dehiss, there can be uh, small leaks or larger leaks, which can in turn lead to stricture and formation later on. Again, the symptoms of this include heartburn, nausea, food intolerance, and the like. The treatment is, well, at first the diagnosis can be made with uh, upper GI barium studies. Usually, again, a small volume of barium should suffice. I mean, you can see in this film, or in this uh, study, static study, you can see it roughly at the inchasura, there is some narrowing before the contrast enters into the antrum. Early on, in the first weeks or month after surgery, you may not have to do anything. Basically, keep the patient on liquids, and if they're, if they're not developing too much dysphagia and they're not vomiting too frequently, that may be all that we, we need to do. As time goes on, there may be edema that will, will dissipate over time. If that's not the case and the patient continues with dysphagia, endoscopic evaluation and, di and potentially dilation may, may prove helpful. Uh, for refractory cases, again, not an emergency, but certainly within the, the realm of sleeve gastrectomy, patients may need to undergo a strictureoplasty or potentially resection of that narrowed segment with a gastrogastrostomy. In some cases, patients may go on to be converted to another operation like a Roux and Y gastric bypass. I'm next going to talk about lap band. The placement is fairly straightforward. We're all fairly familiar, even in, in, if we're not performing the operation. Involves placing a band around the upper part of the stomach, leaving just a pouch in place, and then either with or without some buttress or plication sutures anteriorly, and then a tube which comes out through the abdominal wall, leaving a subcutaneous port, which is just like any infusion port. The complications that result in dysphagia or food intolerance include, include prolapse, which is fairly frequent, erosion of the band into the gastric wall, stomal obstruction, and esophageal dilation. 
<clears throat> acute stomal obstruction may occur perioperatively in the day or days following the operation. Usually we attribute this to excess tissue at the phrenoesophageal fat pad. If we take time to defat that and thin that at the time of surgery, this is much less likely to happen. Alternatively, it may be due to edema at, the, at that area as well. The symptoms are usually food intolerance, inability to advance a, per, a person's diet, epigastric discomfort as the pouch is more and more distended, and progressing potentially to even inability to tolerate their own secretions. The diagnosis may uh, include an upper GI barium study. I think the importance of that is that you can determine that the band is still in correct position and hasn't prolapsed or slipped uh, early on. Um, then treatment may be, may be uh, had with either a nasogastric tube placed to decompress the pouch and wait for the, if it, this is indeed edema to, to uh, abate. Uh, alternatively, if the patient is not improving, we, they may need to go back to the operating room for, to have the band released and the phrenoesophageal fat pad dissected out and, and, and decreased to allow uh, contrast to enter through that channel. Food impaction is what most of us will see. Most patients with lap band will at some point develop food impaction. Either they don't chew their food properly, they eat too much, or they eat too rapidly, and they will experience this food getting stuck above the band. It may also occur after band adjustments where the band has just made, been made a bit too tight. And diagnosis is usually made uh, and, and treatment is by removing fluid from the band, in some cases all or, or some of the fluid from the band, which is a bedside procedure, relatively simple for us to perform, using a non-coring Huber needle. If the patient's uh, symptoms do not improve with this, then going on to an x-ray to make sure the band is at proper angulation, you know, and uh, also if potentially giving barium to make sure there is no prolapse. <clears throat> a band prolapse is the etiology of that is basically the band slips out of place. The idea is that either higher pressure pushes the, down, uh, the band downward from the anterior, on the anterior stomach, or that posteriorly the stomach slides up through the band. The symptoms are typically nausea, dysphagia, uh, food intolerance. And I'm not going to go into too much of this because they'll be talking about this in another talk. Um, diagnosis is typically made, but you're getting an upper GI study. Uh, this is the same patient, these two x-rays. Basically, you see contrast going through the band. This is the, the band going through very quickly and, and entering in the rest of the stomach. This is the patient a year later after they came presented with progressive dysphagia. And you can sort of see the band here beneath this, this prolapsed pocket of, of barium. Um, and then there's no flow of contrast below. If this is, if this is accompanied by <clears throat> either lack of contrast flowing through the band um, or pain, this is an emergency because the patient may go on to get to develop increasing pain and uh, gastric pouch compromise. <clears throat> Treatment in this case is removal of the band, uh, particularly for the non-bariatric surgeon. It's relatively, excuse me, relatively easy to go back into, in surgically, typically laparoscopically and just remove the band. Um, in cases where the stomach is um, not compromised, there's no evidence of ischemia or erosion, if, if you have the, the technical expertise, it's reasonable to replace the band. <clears throat> and in some cases, on a more elective basis, excuse me, the band may be removed and uh, the patient could be potentially converted to a gastric bypass. But again, for, in an emergency situation, that, that isn't really the right move. Um, erosion, I, saw, I alluded to, basically the idea is that the band can erode into the wall of the stomach. Um, I thought that this is either due to a gastric wall ischemia, injury with th such as thermal injury at the time of surgery, <clears throat> or mechanical stress with a band that's too tight. It could also occur because of infection either at the port site, which could track down to the band and uh, cause uh, chronic inflammation or irritation. Um, Can you make the slide go back one? Symptoms are loss of band restriction, fa pain, fever, um, signs of sepsis, not, and potentially nausea and vomiting. Diagnosis is made typically endoscopically. You can actually see the band inside the stomach. Uh, the, then a barium swallow or CAT scan may confirm this. Treatment is removal of the band. Again, you may, you may encounter this. Remove the band, oversew the hole drain widely and consider placing a gastrostomy tube. There have been dis discussion in, in people who have been able to remove the band endoscopically. For most of, the, for most of us, particularly for the non-bariatric surgeon, that's probably not uh, an option. <clears throat> Finally, esophageal dilation. 
Um, the etiology of this is usually uh, und undiagnosed esophageal dysmotility preoperatively um, or excessive restriction with a band that's been excessively tightened or a patient who's perpetually uh, uh, stretched their esophagus by overeating. The symptoms are, as you might imagine, pseudoachalasia type symptoms, nausea, food intolerance, even, even intolerance to liquids or secretions, typically with, accompanied by upper abdominal discomfort. Diagnosis may be made with an upper GI CAT scan or manometry. This is a case of a patient who actually presented with aspiration pneumonia um, and was on pressors in the, in, in the intensive care unit. They got a CAT scan to evaluate the pneumonia and they see, you can see, the, the, lap, the uh, nasogastric tube coiled up in, the, in this mega esophagus along with the pneumonia. Pre before this, the patient had had an upper GI study and you can see mega esophagus here. In this case, the treatment, and, and for most of these patients, is removal of the band and, and perhaps later conversion to a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass or something of the sort. Um, but again, this is, we're talking about emergencies. This would be an emergency um, with, with esophageal dilation. Gastric bypass we're familiar with. There are many ways to root the Roux, and, and that'll be talked about in another talk. But basically, what could cause dysphagia or food intolerance? Basically, anything that will obstruct the Roux or the pouch could, could result in that. Uh, anastomotic strictures, marginal ulceration, um, gastric fistulas, or dump and you have to remember that patients may develop dumping. That may be a cause of food, food intolerance, and that's something that we can manage um, uh, behaviorally. The etiology of stricture is tension or ischemia or technique. EEA staplers have potentially more ischemia, particularly the smaller staplers, and patients are at a higher risk for developing strictures. Um, symptoms are progressive food intolerance, reflux, vomiting, and you can, you can see in the next slide, this is if you were to get an upper GI study, this is what you'd see, just a very narrow outlet for egressive contrast from the pouch. Um, I typically would ex start with an endoscopy, which could be both, treat, both the therapeutic and, and diagnostic. Here they are performing balloon dilation, you can see before and after. And uh, mar marginal ulcers present very similarly. The, I, the thought is this is either due to ischemia on the roux and roux side of things, excess acid due to either gastrogastric fistula or uh, a large gastric pouch with more parietal cell burden. Also, maybe foreign body, such as a, a silk or, or permanent suture at the anastomosis, may set up uh, chronic inflammation resulting in, in uh, ulceration. Also, the most common causes are probably exacerbating local mucosal factors such as smoking or NSAIDs. Uh, I guess I again talked about gastric, gastric fistula, and lesser and more controversial is the role of H. pylori in this setting. Symptoms are pain, food intolerance, dysphagia, um, it potentially it's a very similar to marginal ulceration and, uh, and uh, uh, stricture, but also they may go on to develop bleeding and, perfor and or perforation. The diagnosis is really dependent on the constellation of symptoms. Uh, if, they're just, if they have mild dysphagia, uh, reflux, then endoscopy is, is probably the way to go. Otherwise, if they have more, if you think that there may be something else going on, upper GI may be helpful. In cases of perfor concern for perforation, the CAT scan would certainly be reasonable. Treatment is endoscopy for diagnosis, proton pump inhibitors, caraphate. Some people use prostaglandins. They may be helpful in the, in the setting of aspirin or NSAIDs. Obviously, smoking cessation and avoiding NSAIDs is critically important. And in la as a last resort, for certainly prefer perforation surgery is, is to be performed. This is an example of a a uh, gram patch, essentially, of the, per, of the perforated ulcer. And uh, in, not in the acute setting, but patients may actually requ require revision of that anastomosis. Gastrogastric fistula is, typically uh, occurs after a non-divided gastric pouch, such as a linear stapler, which you saw earlier. Um, they also occur after a gastric bypass in which the patient develops leaks or in the setting of chronic marginal ulcers. Again, the symptoms may be dysphagia, reflux, food intolerance. Uh, or patients may actually regain weight because they've developed this fistula between the pouch and the remnant stomach. The diagnosis is CAT scan or upper GI study. Endoscopy can be diagnostic. This is not typically an emergency unless the patient has, has severe symptoms. Treatment may be with medication, endoscopy, or surgical revision. Thank you very much, Dr. 